All right, hello everyone. My name is Oliver Nelson Jr. I'm a freelance writer and thank you so much. I'm a freelance writer and game developer. Uh, very briefly, this is a collage of some of the projects I've had the fortune of contributing to, including the empathetic narrative platformer Ninja Pizza Girl, the open world flight playground Volo Air Sport, the Buffy esque immersive sim Roguelite Slayer Shock, and the Kickstarter Pathfinder setting Aethera. I also do development work on my own narrative projects, the most well known of which is Screw Your Bear Dad, a game about bears with complex, dysfunctional human family relationships and social structures, because that has somehow become my brand. And Finally, my most recent published work is a game called Pit Pat Devil's Back, an empathetic, free tabletop RPG about mental health, fear, and of course the devil, because that's so cheery. Please keep in mind that this talk contains a major spoiler for The Walking Dead Season 1, Telltale's The Walking Dead Season 1, so if you've not had the chance to play that, watch out for the spoiler, close your eyes, cover your ears, and consider giving it a shot. It is an excellent game. This talk is titled Leaping, Waving, Performing Words with an emphasis on performing because I believe game development, video games themselves, are performance. Our medium is founded upon stagecraft using limited time, limited budgets, and limited technology to make worlds that feel real and cohesive despite being the hacked together product of a dozen disparate disciplines helmed by fallible people coming together to make something greater than the sum of its parts. Depending on the goal of your project, one would hope that players keep playing long enough to suspend their disbelief, to not be tempted to look behind the curtain and wonder about or rage at the mechanisms keeping these worlds running. However, when players do get a glimpse behind the curtain at the processes that make their favorite video games come to life, the reactions can be astonishing. Earlier this year, Kotaku reported upon the use of frustum culling in Horizon Zero Dawn. For those who are not familiar with what frustum culling is, it's the technology that allows a lot of modern games to exist. As the player looks around the world, what this GIF is showing, it is GIF, not GIF, this GIF is showing that as the player looks around and moves around the world, the world is actually being deleted and loaded in real time to make sure that no unnecessary processing power is used. It's a really fascinating technique, but the, because it's such a common one, the difference between how developers reacted and how players reacted to this information was kind of interesting. A lot of developers, their first reaction was to say, why are we talking about this? Everybody knows about this, right? This is boring. Why would we care? On the other hand, this information for a lot of players blew their minds. And I would argue it isn't simply because of the technical feat required to make a game world or a game level be deleted and loaded in real time as fascinating and necessary as that process is. What is astonishing about this glimpse behind the curtain is that as players, we look at Horizon Zero Dawn and we see this expansive, cohesive, beautiful world to explore. It's whole, it's real. But in reality, it's a product made by human beings. It's limited and that's what makes it beautiful, that it takes this stagecraft and these limited tools to make something that, again, is greater than the sum of its parts. In video games, what you see, what you feel, is actually more important than what might exist or what might actually be happening. There's a lot of games that have received accolade upon accolade for looking a lot more impressive or showing simulations that seem deeper than they actually are. And that is for good reason. And when you apply this sort of thinking to the entirety of game development, that game development, that video games themselves are performances, that everything in a video game can aid in telling that performance, that everything in a video game can tell a story, suddenly the significance of every individual element of your game takes on a new importance. 
If everything from the way your AI moves to the dialogue it uses when it announces its intentions matters, suddenly anything in your game can be used to enhance, subvert, or detract from the experience you're attempting to create for your players. Even something as quote unquote simple as the written word. This is a screenshot of one of the first adventure games, Colossal Cave Adventure, or simply Adventure. And for a long time, especially in the adventure and RPG genres, text is what we had. We couldn't depict big, beautiful open worlds, so we had to make it inside our players' heads. And over time, as technology has caught up and the role of text in many genres has been relegated to optional subtitles, it is, again, easy to take something as simple as text for granted. However, as someone who works with narrative design and interactive fiction, I can tell you that even something as quote unquote simple as text can be a huge factor in how players relate to, remember, and interact with your story. There are three major ways to modify text to craft an experience with it. Uh, in my experience. And to demonstrate this, I actually made a small twine game inspired by this tweet. This is a tweet by Mark Laidlaw, or Laidlaw, I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, it has come to be known as Laidlaw's Rule instead of Laidlaw's Law, which is a crime. And it goes, the first line of almost any story can be improved by making sure the second line is, and then the murders began. With that in mind, I made a game, a small demonstration called How Effects Can Make Words Better, using how, and then the murders began, and uh, these various text techniques. The first major way you can use, uh, the first major method you can use to modify text is color. In this first screenshot, you see this is normal black text on an off-white background. Uh, the prose is arranged in a standard literature format. It gets the job done. Uh, but the, at this point, all we're relying upon is the text itself, and the text is, admittedly, boring. It was a dark and stormy night. Rain cracks the pane of a third story window. That's when the murders began, and then the word crack. However, if we add color to this scene, suddenly these words take on an entirely new context. We add black and white, and suddenly these words take on a, uh, the atmosphere of a horror story. Red leaps off of the page. We use green text on a purple background, and the story takes on a supernatural tone, perhaps one of whimsy, perhaps one that's subverted. And if we use dingy yellow text on a green background, suddenly we get the sense of age or decay. The great thing about using color is that, going back to uh, the talk before me, it relies upon our cognitive biases. Depending on the culture you were raised in, when you see the color red, it means stop, attention, warning. This is important. So, in titles like The Legend of Zelda, when you highlight a word in red, it gives you yet another reason to listen to the Deku tree aside from that amazing mustache. It says, hey, using the training that you've already received from your culture, this is important. And we pay attention because something as simple as the coloration of a word can make information leap out at you and take on a new significance. The second major way uh, you can use text, I will be coming back to this example, and the most important one, in my opinion, is timing and interactivity. My particular niche of interactive fiction is kinetic hypertext, or what I like to call text rhythm. What we're doing here is we're breaking up the individual lines. We're using fades and particular effects to make each bit of information seem that much more important. The words, it was a dark and stormy night, fade in before the words start itself, which gives the first screen a sense of movement already. And because each piece of information is coming one by one, We've trained the player to see, okay, white text on a black background is how you interact with this world. So when you see the red line, that's when the murders began, the information leaps out at you. 
and it feels momentous, even though all we've done is change the order of the words and the colors used to convey the message. It does convey an entirely new message in and of itself with a couple of simple, cheap changes. And one of the most effective uses of timing in terms of text, in my opinion, is found in season one of The Walking Dead. Uh, I said that a little bit late, so you might have already seen the spoiler. Sorry. In season one of The Walking Dead, subtitles are optional, and in fact, they are turned off by default. However, if you have them on, the scene where something really bad happens to Lee in episode four of the series takes on a new light. It's actually enhanced by the presence of subtitles because someone took the time to modify how subtitles appeared in the scene rather than simply restating what the char player character said as Lee and the player simultaneously find out this terrible new information. As the camera swoops in and the voice actor delivers their performance, the words at the bottom of the screen are dripping across the bottom and in fact further enhancing what you would think would be an effective scene in and of itself. This timing actually encourages you to take a closer look at the game world itself and so in this case subtitles aren't simply an accessibility option, they add to and enhance the game world rather than detract from it. And the third major way you can use, or method you can use to modify text is movement. And you'll find with this in particular, a little bit of movement can go a long way. Here we again have white text on a black background. And what you see here is first immediately we are again dealing with lines coming one by one and the player has to click on each one to continue the story. But the use of the smear effect on the word dirty and even though we have no quote unquote proper visuals, conveys the sense of a dirty window and further adds an immersion to the scene that didn't exist before. As the player clicks on the word 13th story window and the word began, the word crack for when the rain cracks the pane of that window shudders into life and gives the impression that something momentous has happened, that there is movement, that there is an actual change happening in the game's world when all we really did was add a shutter effect and uh, a smear effect on the word dirty. It was the work of maybe a minute and the entire ambiance and atmosphere that this scene creates has been changed. The Paper Mario RPG series is famous for using these kind of text techniques, color timing and movement and rightfully so, as you can see in this scene. Bowser is shouting, what? And his words are shaking and fill up the entire panel. When the villain speaks, when he laughs, his laugh is shaking up and down, indicating merriment, a little bit of menace. When pe Peach is in pain and being compelled to say these words, the words crawl out across the screen and are highlighted in red to show that something is happening. And in this very small sequence, using a couple of text changes over basic sprites just moving around a little bit, the players get a sense of movement, of tone, of character, and even of the character's individual voices without a single line of voice acting being used. To wrap things all together, there are three major methods you can use to modify text. There's other things you can do. Of course, you can modify any element of your game in any number of ways. But with text, the main elements you're looking at are color, timing, and movement. And what is the common element or the common factor for every single one of these aspects is that, in this case, text is providing context, which was uh, a much funnier pun when I was writing this at 3 AM. In the game Tyranny by Obsidian, when you hover over color text, it not only gives you an idea of the importance of the term being used, but it actually shows an in-game definition of what the heck this thing is. So let's say you put down the game for a few months and then come back. This is a 50-hour RPG. It is not a light time commitment. However, using simple colors and 
the unique needs of this game and genre, the developers provided yet another reason for the player to come back, because if you spent months away and come back, you don't have to say, I'm not gonna play through 10 hours of the opening again to understand what all this means or who these characters are. All you have to do is hover over a couple of words and suddenly, if not all the plot beats come back to your mind, at least the vital information is conveyed without much work at all. In your game, even something as simple as text can aid in the performance and experience you're trying to craft. So any time you can dedicate to making sure anything as simple as or as small as the individual steps your character takes to the, move, to the sense of movement conveyed, to the way you market your game and first put it in front of your players is time and resources worth dedicating. Detail matters no matter what or how insignificant or optional the element may seem. My name is Oliver Nelson Jr. There's a lot of ways you can follow and find my work. And uh, as I said earlier, I am a freelance writer and narrative designer. So if you need someone to write those words, please, for the love of God, hire me. Uh, thank you so much for listening. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much.